is the last Sunday after Epiphany. Um, we are going to be, after this week, entering into the season of Lent. And so this is the, the last Sunday in Epiphany. We begin on page 45 of the Book of Alternative Services. If you don't have a Book of Alternative Services, you'll find it in the, the link below the video. You'll find a, a link that will bring you to a PDF version of the Book of Alternative Services if you don't have a Book of Alternative Services yourself. Let's take a few moments to center ourselves before we begin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, of mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, open our lips, and our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Hallelujah. The Lord is our light and our life. O oh, come, let us worship. The Venite on page 49. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with songs. For the Lord is a great God, and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. 
The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Or that today you would hearken to his voice. The Lord is our light and our life. O come with us, worship. Our readings today, our Old Testament reading today is from Exodus chapter 34, verses 29 to 35. Exodus 34, 29 to 35. When Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand as he came down from the mountain, Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone because he had been talking with God. Aaron and all the people of Israel saw Moses, and behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near him. But Moses called to them, and Aaron and all the leaders of the congregation returned to him. And Moses talked with them. Afterward, all the people of Israel came near, and he commanded them, commanded them all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. And when Moses had finished speaking with them, he put a veil over his face. Whenever Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he would remove the veil until he came out. And when he came out and told the people of Israel what he was commanded, the people of Israel would see the face of Moses, but the skin of Moses' face was shining. And Moses would put the veil over his face again until he went in to speak with him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm today is from Psalm 99. You can find that on page 837 in the Book of Alternative Services. Page 837, Psalm 99. The Lord is King. Let the people tremble. He is enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth shake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is high above all peoples. Let them confess his name, which is great and awesome. He is the Holy One. Almighty King, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and fall down before his footstool. He is the Holy One. Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among those who call upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them out of the pillar of cloud. They kept his testimonies and the decree that he gave them. The Lord our God, you answered them indeed. You were a God who forgave them, yet punished them for their evil deeds. Proclaim the greatness of the Lord our God and worship him upon his holy hill. The Lord our God is the Holy One. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our second reading from the Epistles is Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 3, verses 12 to chapter 4, verse 2. 2 Corinthians 3, 12 to 4, 2. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted, 
Because only through Christ is it taken away. Yet to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our Gospel reading is from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 9, verses 28 to 43. Luke, chapter 9, verses 28 to 43. Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. As he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Behold, a man from the crowd cried out, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son, for he is my only child. And behold, a spirit seized him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and shatters him, and will hardly leave him. And I begged your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. While he was coming, the demon threw him to the ground and convulsed him. But Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit and healed the boy and gave him back to his father. And all were astonished at the majesty of God. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please pray with me. Lord, we ask that we would understand your word, that your word would be planted deep in our hearts and would grow and bear fruit in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today we've, read, we've reached the end of the season of Epiphany, or the season after Epiphany. Epiphany, as I said um, at the beginning of the season, comes from the Greek word meaning manifestation. And uh, in the medieval church, they actually used the word theophany. 
Theo is the word for God. So it's, it's more like manifestation, a revealing of God. And that's sort of what the season is about. It's about how God has been made manifest in Jesus and revealed um, divine teaching through the person of Jesus. Uh, the season is bookended by two, two events. One is the visit of the Magi to Jesus and his parents when, at the beginning. And then at the end, it's bookended by, the, um, by Jesus transfigured on the mountain. And so these are both kind of revealings of who Jesus is. Right before our gospel reading today, Jesus asks his disciples a question. He says, who do the crowds say that I am? And they report back rumors that have been circulating. John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say one of the old prophets risen again. Jesus then turns and asks them a more important question. His second question is not about what people say, but what they say as his disciples. Right? This is a challenge, right? Uh, we can hide behind opinions, public opinions, uh, the opinions of scholars and friends, but there comes a point when we have to decide who he is and what will determine his power in our life or our opinion about who he is will determine his power in our life. When I was in university, I was doing a, a bachelor's degree in religious studies, which we study the world religions in that degree. And so what we would do is we would study history and we would study uh, sort of belief systems of these different religions, but we always studied it very much at arm's length. So we would look at the history behind Pure Land Buddhism and we would look at what they believe and what, what is their belief system and their structure? How do they understand how to be human and how to work through the world? But the question we never asked, we always bracketed this out, was we never asked, is this true? That was sort of a forbidden question in the religious studies field. We always bracketed that out and put it aside and never dealt with it. So we always dealt with how, what is their history? What do they believe? And we kept it sort of over there. And it was a bit of a shock, I have to say, when I got to seminary and I was asked to write essays about what I believe to be true, <laughs> not about what these people over there believed or the history of this or that, what I actually believed to be true about reality. Rather than the history of those people over there and their belief system. Because um, I could always sort of say, this is what they think, this is what they believe, they're a little wacky, <laughs> right? Uh, but when I have to say, it's a, there's something vulnerable about me saying what I believe to be absolutely true about reality. So Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? This is Luke 9, verse 20. And this is the more important question, right? This is for the disciples as well as for us. We can spend a lot of time theorizing about who Jesus might be without actually committing ourselves to an answer. Just as I spent time learning the history of and the philosophy of Buddhism without actually committing myself to it, we can do that with Jesus. We can look at Jesus, the stories about Jesus. We can look about and read books about people talking about Jesus, about who he is, what they think about him. But where the rubber hits the road is when we have to commit ourselves to saying what I believe to be absolutely true about reality and about Jesus and his relationship to, to my life. There's a big difference between admiring Jesus as an in an academic way and committing to him as my Lord. And so representing the disciples, Peter answers this question. He says, the Christ of God. To the question, who do you say that I am? Peter answers, you are the Christ of God. If we say Jesus was a kind and idealistic young man who lived a long time ago, our lives won't be altered by that necessarily. Uh, we can feel free to ignore his direction and his teachings as mere suggestions. But if we declare Jesus to be the image of God on earth and our Lord, our master who knows best how to be human, the one who speaks the most true things that have ever been said by a human being, well, that will change everything because what he says is actually the final word of authority on all subjects that he addresses. 
for us to call him Lord and then ignore what he says about life is hypocrisy. We either ignore his words and reject him as our master, or we apply his words as having authority in our life, and we allow him to be seated on the throne of our life and rule our life as our master. Anything else is hypocrisy. And that's the challenge that's put in front of us when, when we have to answer that question, who do you say that I am? Immediately after Peter's declaration that Jesus is the Christ of God, Jesus begins talking about how he has to suffer. He has to be rejected, he has to be killed, and he then extends this to those who are going to follow him. They too must deny themselves and pick up their cross. This issue of the suffering of Christ and his disciples' suffering by extension is central to these issues of identity. So who is Jesus? Yes, he is the Christ of God, and he will have to suffer and be rejected because of it. And this is not easy to accept for the, the disciples. The identity of the Messiah at, the, at that time was as a warrior king, like King David, who would remove the oppression of Rome and restore the dignity of the nation of Israel, reunite them all. Suffering and dying was not a part of that image. It, was, it wasn't a part of that identity. So raised as they were with this image, they might very well be asking themselves if this really is the Messiah that the scriptures are speaking about. It's understandable if they doubt when this, is, this image that they have of who the Messiah is supposed to be gets shattered. And this is when we get to the transfiguration story. So Jesus as Messiah, suffering is included as a part of that. And then you can imagine all the doubts that would come in and then transfiguration. Jesus brings three of his disciples up a mountain to pray. And mountains to the ancient peoples were kind of like suburbs of heaven. So um, it sounds kind of silly to modern minds until you're standing on top of a mountain and then you kind of understand. Suddenly they see Jesus transfigured. His face is changed and his robe becomes white and glistening. He looks like a heavenly being, um, which is, of course, who he is. He came from heaven. He existed before his own birth. And what we see in Jesus is this divine light emanating out from him. What Moses had in our first reading was almost like the light of the moon. Right? It reflected, God's light reflected off of Moses' face from having been with God. But Jesus, this is like the light of the sun, right? It's, it's divine light emanating from him. The Eastern Orthodox Church sees the transfiguration as Jesus revealing his divinity. Right? Jesus is God. This is the revealing of who he actually is. This divine light shines from within him. Something hidden is revealed and the disciples see another level of truth about Jesus. And two others appear with Jesus. They see Moses and Elijah and they're talking with Jesus. Their appearance shows that what Jesus is doing is in line with what God has always been doing. What Jesus is doing is supported by the representatives of both the law, that's Moses, and the prophets, represented by Elijah. Jesus is not starting a new religion. That's what is trying to be said here. Jesus isn't doing something completely different. He is in line with what God has always been doing. Though, Jesus is leading God's followers to a new covenant, a new stage in their life with God. He's in line with what God has always been doing, but things are going to change. There's a new covenant that he is putting into place. And what are Moses and Elijah talking to Jesus about? They're talking about his exodus is the original Greek. Um, in our reading, they use the word departure, but if you look at the Greek, it says exodus. And that word has all kinds of connotations, as you can imagine. They're talking about his exodus that he would accomplish in Jerusalem. And just as Moses led the exodus of the Hebrews out of slavery in Egypt to the promised land, so Jesus is going to lead an exodus out of slavery to the power of sin and death. 
In a way, the people were saved from physical slavery in Egypt, but they remained spiritually enslaved to the ways of Egypt. Right? Their hearts constantly yearned to go back to Egypt. As we read through the Exodus story, there's lots of times where the people are yearning to go back to Egypt, which is a place of slavery. And in a way, what was missing was the slavery was still in their hearts. They were trying to excise that, release that slavery from inside their hearts. Jesus was going to continue that work. He was going to continue that exodus and bring them spiritual freedom, that ultimate freedom. And Peter, not knowing what to do, but feeling he should do something, <laughs> we've all been in that situation, I think, he speaks up. Uh, should I set up three tents? One for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah? It seems like Peter still isn't getting it. My, I think a lot of us can relate to that. Uh, Peter might be thinking that his image of the Messiah as the, the warrior ruler king is coming true. Right? So tonight they set up camp and tomorrow they head into Jerusalem with Moses and Elijah to set up the kingdom on earth. Right? Just imagine all of them marching into the temple. Who's going to deny Jesus, Moses, and Elijah access to the temple and to taking over? Um, and conveniently, they skip over that little suffering bit. While Peter's still speaking these words, a cloud overshadows them. This is like the glory of God that rested on Mount Sinai and that filled the temple. This cloud surrounds them and they hear a voice this is my beloved son, hear him. They hear the voice of God the Father and he declares that he has a special and intimate relationship with Jesus. He is his beloved son. And these words echo the words we hear at Jesus' baptism. The disciples are reassured that Jesus is indeed in line with God's will, with what God has always been doing. The implication is that they have to be willing to adjust their image of the Messiah. I think that for us, there are parts of who Jesus is that we sometimes don't want to see. There are things he says that we want him to soften. There are things that he says that we want to harden. We want him to say it stronger. There are things he is silent on that we wish he spoke about. And there are things he addresses that we wish he, he didn't. There are parts about Jesus we want to emphasize and follow, and there are also parts that we just, we are just unwilling to incorporate into our life. And at that point, we have to ask ourselves what we mean when we call Jesus our Lord. Is it just a word? Or do we actually believe that he has a right to tell us how to live our lives? Does he actually know the best way to be human? Or do we know better than him? The apostles had to adjust their image of Messiah. Are there ways in which we need to adjust our image of Jesus? Right? Sometimes we try to use him to support our cause, our, maybe our political position, our, our ideological, philosophical stance. But that's not a Lord. That's a servant if we try to make him serve our cause. What does it mean for him to be our Lord and for us to serve his cause? How would we have to change to make that happen? So perhaps as we prepare to enter into Lent, we could hear the Father's words with a new kind of gravity. Listen to him. Perhaps we can allow those words to change how we hear every gospel reading as we hear with hearts that desire to live out his teachings, as we allow him to sit on the throne of our lives. Amen. I invite you to take a moment and consider what God might be saying to you.
the Apostles' Creed is found on page 52. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I will leave space during the intercessions for you to bring forward your own uh, concerns. Let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord for a day of fulfillment and peace. Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord to teach us to love others as he has loved us. Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord for peace and justice in the world. Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord to strengthen and relieve those who are in need. Lord, have mercy. Let us ask the Lord to renew the church through the power of his life-giving spirit. Lord, have mercy.
Almighty God, on the holy mount, he revealed to chosen witnesses your well-beloved Son, wonderfully transfigured. Mercifully deliver us from the darkness of this world and change us into his likeness from glory to glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. On page 54, now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Well, thank you very much for joining me for morning prayer.